I am with the Friends of the World War II Memorial. And of course, we are gathered here <coughs> not only to hear a distinguished speaker, but as part of the, uh, I guess you would say, the prolegomenon uh, to one of our great national holidays uh, tomorrow, Veterans Day. Our speaker this morning is Alex Kershaw. By most accounts, by most estimates, probably the most prolific and profound historian, British military historian, now writing. And we are blessed to have him here. He is an old friend of the United States and of her military institutions and an active member of the Friends of the World War II Memorial. Will you join me in welcoming Alex Kershaw? Good morning. Can you hear me okay? Um, it's a wonderful thing to be able to take my mask off. I don't think you can, but I am enjoying every second of this. Um, thank you for that very kind introduction, Sai. And uh, I'm very, very honored to be here to talk to you about one of the most remarkable Americans I've had the great honor of interviewing. In the last couple of decades, I've probably interviewed over 100 World War II veterans. And General Felix Sparks, as his rank was when I interviewed him on his deathbed, six months before he died, age 90, was the one veteran that left the deepest impression on me. Uh, hugely affected me, and I was very inspired and very moved by his story. So I'm not going to lecture you today. I'm going to ramble through some photographs, but I really want you to try and feel his life. I want you to feel, perhaps, what he was going through and understand some of the really terrible and very difficult command decisions that this one extraordinary soldier had to entertain and deal with in World War II. Arbeit macht frei, a wonderful German phrase, work will set you free, the ultimate Nazi lie. And I show it to you here because this is where Felix Sparks, after a 500-day odyssey, this is where he ended his extraordinary journey. I have, if I have a moral, if I have a theme, it is that character is destiny. The decisions that you make in life, they determine who you become. And that is certainly true, I would hope you would agree, in the military. The decisions you make at the sharp end under enormous stress, unimaginable stress, they will define who you become as a leader and as a human being. Sparks was born in abject poverty in Texas. He moved to Miami with his family in the 1930s. Extraordinarily bright. His father was a minor. He had four brothers and sisters. He graduated from his high school as a valedictorian. Smartest guy in the class, but he had no money. And one day, his mother gave him a pair of Levi's. There was a secret pocket in the Levi's with $38 in the pocket. And his father took him down to the nearest railroad track, and he looked him in the eye at age 18, and Sparks wanted to be a lawyer, wanted to go to college. He looked him in the eye and said, we can't afford to feed you. You're on your way, son. With a grub steak in his pocket, he boarded a train, and he rode the rails for two years. Imagine that. Crisscrossed America for two years, aged 18, trying to find work, trying to find a life, trying to find a future. He ended up in San Francisco on Market Street, homeless. And he walked one day past an army recruiter. And the army recruiter said to him, hey, bud, do you want to join the army? And he said, no way, absolutely no way. He walked on and thought to himself, it would be nice to sleep on a bed. It would be nice to have a roof over my head and three square meals. He walked back, nodded, took a token, and ended up in the US Army. Now, in the 1930s, if you joined the US Army at that point, you were given a choice as to where you wanted to serve. And he very wisely chose Hawaii. Had a very um, nice time for a couple of years, excuse me. Um, I will move on rapidly. 
served in Hawaii. He said that when he went to Hawaii, the, he crossed under the Golden Gate Bridge. It was half complete, and when he came back in 1938, it was complete. He then went to the University of Arizona, where he met his wife, Mary, here. Some of you may be able to guess what scene this is from a famous Shakespeare play. It's Romeo and Juliet. Um, they were married in 1941, just before Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor happens, and anybody who'd been in a uniform finds themselves back in a uniform and back serving. Sparks joined the 157th Infantry Regiment from the 45th Thunderbird Division, a magnificent outfit that some of you may have heard of. One thing distinguished that unit to others. Over, of the 14,000 Americans that went and served in the European theater that left America, over 1,500 were Native Americans. Over 30 tribes represented, true braves. It was the most diverse unit, American Infantry Division, that served in the European theater. There's the great man himself. I'm a huge fan an incredibly complex, flawed, brilliant, insane, wonderful, wonderful general. I think the most aggressive American general of World War II. And here he is at Gala. It's a famous photograph. Just a couple of days after the Americans and the British and the Canadians had landed in Sicily. Day one that the Allies, day one that the Americans started to liberate, to free Europe from untold darkness and evil, was the 10th of July, 1943, when we landed in Sicily. There's Sparks' wife, Mary, and it would be two long, very, very long years before he would even hold his son. Sparks told Mary, told me, in fact, that when he last, she last saw Felix, they were in Boston, and she was so pregnant that she had to, he had to reach around her like this to be able to hug her and say goodbye. An image that he treasured, an image that he would look at every now and again when he gave up hope, when there was no rational hope of surviving. He would look at this image to remind him, as he told me, of why he should try to survive. Um, have a look at the image here and the face of that young American. Fear, terror is a replacement walking into one of the most disappointing and depressing battles that Americans have ever been involved in, the Battle of Anzio, a three-month bloody, enervating stalemate. Anzio, for Sparks, was his third amphibious invasion. Sicily, number one, Salerno, number two, September 1943, where the Allies were almost pushed back into the Mediterranean, a huge, embarrassing debacle. We only just pulled ourselves out of the fire. Germans, incredibly well-led. Experts in defensive warfare. We'll have this mountain. Take it from us. There's a mountain behind us. You'll have to take that too. Mountains, mules, and men. And attrition. Terrible attrition. There's a picture. I don't need to be too explicit, but that's... There was a German wounded, and they are just outside a place on the Anzio Plain called the Caves, man-made caves. In February 1944, the Germans launched Operation Fishbane, which was an attempt to throw the Allies off the Anzio Plain. For 10 days, Sparks, Felix Sparks, who was by now a company commander, E Company 157th, his men were surrounded by the Germans and were constantly bombarded. At one point, Sparks had to do what's called, I guess you might use the term today too, he had to pull the chain. And that meant that he had to call in his own artillery on his own position. At the end of 10 days, having been surrounded by the Germans, he and a dozen or so other men tried to escape the caves and get back to Allied lines. 200 men in E Company. He's 24 years old. Only two men from his company that he commanded got back to Allied lines, Felix Sparks and a supply sergeant. The supply sergeant was killed. There he is on the right here, just after the Battle of the Caves. And there's a picture of the cost of the breakout from Anzio. Leon Sear, the supply sergeant, was killed 
during that breakout, leaving Sparks, a company commander of 200 men, as the only survivor from that company. Everybody else was captured, wounded, or killed. And I would ask you to think about what that might feel like, what that might mean to you as a 24-year-old, entrusted with 200 lives, and every man has gone. This is a third division soldier here. In one day, 26th of May, 1944, over 900 men were killed from one US Infantry Division, the 3rd Infantry Division. To break out from Anzio, to break out of that ring of steel, that ring of iron, was enormously costly. We succeeded, but imagine your division commander, your Truscott, and you realize that someone is saying to you, you've just lost 900 men killed in one day. The largest number of men killed from any American division in one day during World War II. There he is on the left. He's now been promoted to a major. He told me that it was very easy to get promoted in World War II. It was incredibly easy. All he had to do was stay alive. I love this photograph. I'm a romantic. You can probably tell I often get quite emotional. I won't apologize for that. But this is a picture of ultimate, ultimate American beauty. It's my, one of my favorite photographs from World War II. These are Thunderbirds. This gentleman here looks like my son. I uh, visited a high school a couple of days ago, and all of the 16, 17-year-olds I was talking to looked very much like these guys. These are 157th Infantry Regiment guys. They are chasing the Germans north along the Rhone Valley towards Germany, towards the Heimwehr. They are pausing, they are bathing, they are washing, they are taking a brief rest as they chase the Germans north. The new world coming back to liberate the old. It's a beautiful photograph. And this is uh, the Colt 45, uh, Sparks after the war was interviewed about the effectiveness of certain weapons, and he said it was useless. It was like a pea shooter. Anybody that was five, ten yards from you, fine, you might have a chance, but otherwise it was useless. There's the Thunderbird symbol here, a very potent, beautiful symbol, especially if you're a Native American. Very potent indeed. You'll notice on the pistol here, the 45, that under the, they've taken off the grip that's a piece of perspex from a downed B-17 bomber. And underneath it, Sparks has placed the picture of Mary, his wife. So every now and again, he would pull out that pistol and remind himself of why he needed to go home. Sparks didn't use the pistol very often. Uh, instead, he used a shotgun. Um, his men found out that he'd hunted as a child to put food on the table. And they found him a shotgun. It was sawn off. And believe it or not, his nickname was Shotgun Sparks, and he would use a shotgun. Much more effective in a crisis, in a, a moment of danger, with two or three Germans facing you to have a shotgun at close range than a pistol. Reifersweiler, Vosges. Does anybody here, I'm going to ask a question, you don't have to answer, but does, does anybody know where Reifersweiler is? It's, uh, I'll tell you, it's on the German border. As we got closer to Germany, and when I say we, I mean the Allies, as we got closer to Germany, we realized that they weren't going to give up. As one SS veteran told me, I had not fought for four years to drop my gun at the border. When you step onto my homeland, it's my homeland, and I'm going to defend it. This is on the German border. In late January 1945, as a battalion commander, a 25-year-old with 800 men now under his command, he was ordered to place his battalion along the ridge line, just above those phosphorus explosions there. We were using phosphorus an awful lot by that time in the war. A piece the size of my little fingernail here would burn through a civilian in a couple of seconds. 800 men placed along the ridge line. Sparks protested to his commanding general. General Frederick, one of the great, great warriors of World War II, seven Purple Hearts. He protested that this was not a good idea. 
His men were too far ahead, they couldn't be supplied, they couldn't be supported. They would be exposed. Over a week, seven unimaginable days in late January 1945, the 6th SS Division, with very extensive experience of winter warfare, methodically, day after day, night after night, wiped out most of his battalion. Going from one end of the ridgeline, methodically, each day, to the other. Timing their attacks for maximum emotional and psychological damage. So that everybody on that ridgeline knew what was coming next. Sparks tried to rescue his men. He hadn't wanted this to happen in the first place. He tried to rescue his men, he commandeered a tank. Some people believe that the action merited the Medal of Honor. He was recommended for the DSC. He did manage to save several of his men. But the fact was that the battalion was lost. And yet again, incredibly, out of the 800 men, 200 were killed, buried beneath a blanket of fresh snow, and the rest were captured or wounded. Out of 800, only two men, extraordinarily, managed to get back to report to Felix Sparks, one of whom is actually alive today. So I would like you to, to try and imagine what it would be like to be a 25-year-old. You've now been in combat consistently for over 300 days. You've been wounded twice. You've been sent back to North Africa because you were wounded badly. You went to a hospital. You left the hospital against orders. You flew back to your men in Italy. You rejoined your men in the Italian campaign. And then you led E Company and then progressed through the ranks to the point where you were a lieutenant colonel. And then you lose 800 men. Sparks never recovered from those losses. He told me I never, ever got over that. There were 28 platoon leaders out of those 800 men that were lost. These were young men that looked to him for leadership. Brilliant young men, many of them. Great future leaders that never really got to lead. And it was his men. His men. I think this is a picture of what... Um, what I believe keeps men fighting, and women, what keeps them in the game, what can make them do extraordinary things, it's a picture of love. Forgiveness, love, those are the lessons that I was taught by the veterans that I interviewed that served with Sparks. That to, to forgive, to be kind, to look after people, look after your men. Make sure they know that you look after them and love them. Up here, unfortunately, we've placed the blue banner up here above the hand. But that's the hand of a man who may be dying, but is in terrible pain. Of Schaffenberg, central Germany. And note the leg, the thinness of the limb. These guys weren't well fed in the 1930s. And they certainly that weren't that well fed in the US Army in World War II. When they took a shower once every maybe three or four months, Sometimes they're on the line for over 100 days, constantly. When they took a shower off, there would be a dark stain around their neck here, and the rest of their bodies would be marbled muscle. No fat, just sinew and muscle, and pure white. Um, that's a grip. That's a grip, a man holding on to life, being treated by his fellow Thunderbirds. Our oh, Schaffenberg, where is that? I'm sure some of you know where... How Schaffenberg is. In late March and early April of 1945, the 157th Infantry Regiment was asked to occupy and take this small city in central Germany. Over a week, the 45th Infantry Division suffered two and a half thousand casualties in a city back in the US that no one knew or cared about. Two or three weeks from the end of the war, they're taking very high casualties particularly when they encounter the SS. The SS are extremely efficient, they are die-hard, and they will fight right to the bitter end with enormous passion and disturbing effectiveness. 29th of April, 1945, Lieutenant Colonel Felix Sparks, age 25, this is almost around about his 500th day of combat, 
500 days. Now I want to step aside from my main narrative just for a moment. The US Army was very worried in World War II about combat fatigue, about the gradual and then sudden breakdown of men in combat. And they commissioned various studies and one report stated explicitly that no man, and I quote directly, no man is an iron man. 200 days, you're done. 200 days in continuous combat, you will break down. You will cease, quote, to be an effective combat leader. Your mind, your body, your nervous system cannot take any more than that. We are human. We are not supermen. This is Sparks's 500th day, not of continuous combat, but of combat. Many men went beyond that limit, went beyond 200 days. Many leaders were broken. They were absolutely fundamentally broken and many times ineffective. But they had no choice, most of them, but to carry on, but to continue to lead and to carry on. Sparks was given a very important job at the end of the war. He was a task force commander, and it was called Task Force Sparks. And the job, the mission of this task force, was to go and hunt down and capture Adolf Hitler. It's a wonderful job at the end of the war to have the, and a great honor to be asked to do that. Early on the morning of the, 8th, of the 29th of April, around 8 o'clock in the morning, Sparks, Lieutenant Colonel Felix Sparks, received an order, and it was to divert his task force towards a place called Dachau. He had no idea what Dachau was, where it was, and he was annoyed. In fact, he told me I was really pissed off. I had a better job to do than go to some podunk little suburb of Munich. I had a mission. These are men from I Company. I Company, 157th, 45th Infantry Division, on the outskirts of Dachau. Where I am now, where you are, sir, is about where Sparks would have been. He was always close to the front. Always close to the front. He told me and he, he told many other people, there's no way that you can command men in combat at a rank of captain, major, and I don't care, even lieutenant colonel, unless you're close, unless you can see the men in front of you and what they're doing. You may disagree with me, but that was his philosophy. So he's following these guys, and this is around about 10 o'clock in the morning on the 29th of April, 1945, almost a week from the end of that terrible war in which 19 million of my fellow European civilians were killed. And there's the death train. This is the first thing that uh, Sparks and his men saw when they moved into the complex of Dachau. Kaiser Dachau was a concentration camp at the center, but it was a barracks and there was an infirmary there, etc. 2,000 dead human beings They've been sent from Buchenwald, and they are lying there, rotting in the crisp spring sun. Sparks' first reaction was to vomit. He fell to his knees and he vomited. Many of his men also vomited. The smell was like a slaughterhouse, a vast slaughterhouse. And he said later after the war that the thing that really stunned us, the thing that we've never been able to move beyond in our lives, is the fact that this was beyond, far beyond the human imagination. We could not process the fact that human beings could do this to other human beings. And he said, we'd seen everything. We'd seen every atrocity in war. We'd seen everything that human beings can do to other human beings. We'd seen all the civilian so-called collateral damage, etc. We'd seen the full horrors, but we'd never seen anything like this. How could human beings do this to other human beings? He lost control of his men. He said for about half an hour. Who knows how long it was. But he lost control. He told me, I lost control of my men. Grief, disgust, nausea turned slowly and then very quickly to rage. There's a photograph of uh, what, how... There's a photograph of racism. That's what happens when you are taught to hate other people. That's why we had to end that war. That's the story of that war. 
Um, one of the boxcars, there was a 15, 16 year old girl, Sparks, walked along the boxcars and he said later that I saw this girl and she was lying on top of a, body, a pile of bodies. She had red hair and her eyes were open. And he said she was looking at me and as if she was asking me, what took you so long? What took you so long? Every day that we were halted, every mountain that we had to cross, every river that we had to ford was another day before we could end this. Another day added to the list of dark days in which millions were industrially slaughtered. Every holdup stopped us from stopping this. Um, Sparks was the commanding officer. He was the commanding officer of the first Americans to enter into the longest standing concentration camp in Nazi Germany. Formed in 1933, Dachau had over 38,000 inmates in it on the 29th of April 1945 from over 50 nationalities. The Kohl, the list of victims, the list of Nazism's enemies got, grew longer and longer and longer. And remarkably, there were over a thousand Catholic priests in Dachau when it was liberated. Relatively very, relatively few Jews. In the middle of the, uh, the KZ Dachau concentration camp, there was a dog kennel. And these dogs were 122, I learned, of these dogs. And the Thunderbirds walked into the kennel. They were told what these dogs had done. And they killed every single one. But there was one that wouldn't die and it became a mythical dog, a devil dog, a symbol of canine pure evil. And a Thunderbird had to take his dagger and slit that dog's throat. But they killed every single one and did so, in some cases, with great joy. The favorite trick of the SS in Dachau was to take a particularly obdurate, resistant, and crucify them and put them against a stake. And then the dogs would be given a reverse command and they would rip the testicles from the victim. This is one of the things that the SS, in their great boredom, would... Uh, these were games they played. Um, that morning, there were dozens of Germans lying under pure white sheets in an infirmary. And there were others that had served on the Eastern Front that had nothing to do with KZ Dachau. Almost all of the guards had fled. They weren't stupid. They knew what might happen when the Americans arrived, when the rows of green helmets would pass the barracks. These are men that have been taken from an infirmary, from a barracks. Many of them have served, as I said, on the Eastern Front. They are not murderers, not murderers anyway in KZ Dachau. And they are rounded up by Sparks' men, and you see them here, with their hands in the air. Note the hands in the air. And they're taken here, to a coal yard. The reason why the coal yard doesn't have any coal in it is because they've used all the coal to burn the evidence. But still, there were thousands of bodies lying everywhere throughout the camp. And this is a picture of a crime. It's a war crime. It's perhaps the most notorious committed by American soldiers during the liberation of Europe. Against the wall here, you'll see three Germans, three fanatics. And I was very taken by this image when I first saw it because I was amazed by these three men standing there. Shoot me, I don't care. I'm a proud Nazi. I'm not going to jump to the ground. I'm not going to lie among these guys here pretending to be dead. I'm not going to pretend to be wounded. Shoot me right now. I'm proud. This is a 19-year-old over here, 19 years old on a machine gun. He's just moved back and forth maybe four or five seconds with the American machine gun. A lieutenant over here in the corner you can't see, he's just off the picture, a guy called Bill Walsh. He gave the order to kill, to open fire. And this, they have killed at least a dozen Germans SS veterans who had their hands up in the air against the back of the Collier Ward wall. And as I said, maybe two dozen are wounded. 
Where's Lieutenant Colonel Felix Sparks? These are his men. How could this happen under his command? How could it happen? Well, I should say it happened because these guys were full of hatred and vengeance. And they had seen such enormous atrocity that they wanted to punish immediately those who they thought mistakenly had carried out these injustices. This is where Sparks was. He was in a building. He was taken away from the coal yard. He was given a short tour of various places near that coal yard and was taken into a building just behind the coal yard. And he later said that uh, this is a pretty accurate depiction of what he saw, but there were so many bodies placed, rammed into that room, that there was no space for a single one more from the floor to the ceiling, rammed full of bodies. Suddenly he hears firing. He hears the firing. He hears the actions of his men in the coal yard and he runs back to the coal yard where he had left his men guarding prisoners. And that's him there. Lieutenant Colonel, 25-year-old Felix Sparks. Later on he said, I could see it was me immediately because that's my map in my pocket with the 45 with the picture of his wife under the grip. This is a, a remarkable image. I think it's really extraordinary for many reasons, but I would ask you in your entire military career, when you retire or when you look at other people's careers, I know people in this room and watching have served in combat. They've been through enormous, enormous trauma and difficult times. But I'd ask you to think about this. Was there a single moment for you when a cameraman caught this image a moment in your life when it showed you at your very best. It showed the essence of who you were as a human being and as a leader of men and today women in combat. Could anybody have taken a freeze frame of your life, of your career, of the things that you care most about when you were doing them? And this is it. This is a signal call cameraman. The signal call cameraman was with Sparks that day because he was looking for the big story Stick with Sparks and you might get the picture of Adolf. And so this is a frame from several frames taken from a film by a signal core cameraman and the film was found decades later. And I want you to look at the pistol and look at the commanding officer's hand and watch what happens. Bang, 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 four more bangs, eight bullets fired. And watch the hand again. Stop. He shouted out, stop. Now some of you watching this, looking at this, might think that's exactly what any good officer should do. That is what an officer should do. An officer should stop a war crime, a massacre. But then so many didn't. Really would you have stopped it? Of course I would hope you would. But imagine the environment, the context, what you've been through. He'd lost 800 men to the SS just three or four months before. What do you do? He does the right thing. Now I can be, I can pretend to be a fake patriot. I could tend, pretend to say, you know, this is what Americans did. This is what separated you from the enemy. This is, you're a different breed and we know that's, that's not true. We're all human beings. We all make mistakes. We are all vulnerable. But Sparks later believed fundamentally that the American spirit, as he called it, and I don't know whether I agree with him, but he believed it was the American spirit that, that made his men persevere and win through to victory. He marveled at it. He said, every day I woke up and my job was to get Americans killed and they were wonderful people. They were wonderful, wonderful people. I gave them an order, they carried it out. Every day my job was to get more and more people killed. And it was a good day if I lost 12, and it was a really bad day if I lost more. But every day I gave a command, every day I gave an order, they got out of their foxholes, and they moved forward. 
So we didn't, we didn't have to retreat to win this war. We were moving forward for over 2,000 miles. That meant every day Americans had to get up and move forward towards the enemy, had to attack. Um, at the end of that odyssey, he said that I hadn't got to Dachau. I didn't go all the way and get to Dachau to be just like them. I was not going to be like them. I was not going to let my be men behave like them. We were different, surely. Surely there was something about us whereby we could retain our dignity, where we, where we could not be beasts. Unfortunately, some of his men committed that crime. This is a picture of joy, of liberation. I, the next, this, on this day, the 30th of April, the 45th Infantry Division newspaper had a headline, and it said, this is why we fought, with images from the camp, from the liberation. And the men I'm about to show you now, there, are the liberators. They fought with the 157th Infantry Regiment. Only one of them is alive today. This gentleman over here, Guy Prestia, over 500 days of combat. Day one, Sicily, ended up at Dachau. He was a mortar man and then carried a BAR. He's still alive today. The only man from this group of men I interviewed over 10 years ago. These men, I believe, were blessed. And they were also cursed. They were blessed if they saw the horrors of Dachau because they understood why they had fought. Throughout that 500 days, many of them didn't believe in much at all. Many of them gave up hope. They became nihilistic. They weren't motivated by patriotic causes. They laughed and sneered at the view of the dining room politicians back at home. They only wanted to do one thing. They wanted to live and get the hell out of there. They were blessed because they understood, some of them, why so many of their friends had had to die, why they had been so brutalized, why they, in many cases of the men here, would spend the rest of their lives trying to come to terms with what they did to others and what was done to them, what they became. Um, I will wrap up now, and I want to show you this photograph. It's a map from the official history of the 157th Infantry Regiment, and it shows you the long odyssey of working class, predominantly Americans, who were drafted into that worst of all wars from North Africa, day one, Sicily, southern Italy, Operation Dragoon, all the way up the Rhone, into the heart of Nazi Germany, and finally to Dachau. It's a beautiful odyssey. I think it's the most moving and inspiring of your history. Those of you who are American, I know that we have other nationalities here, but I think it's an incredibly powerful journey. The new world coming back to the old. To restore light where there was great darkness. To create a continent that I grew up in as a European. I'm 55. A continent that since World War II has not experienced another conflict. A continent that is in peace and is democratic and mostly prosperous. It's an enormous, enormous legacy. And one that all those who made that journey, and there are not many left, one, of, one which those men should be enormously proud of. Thank you for listening to me. I would love to answer any questions. You've been a, a great audience. Thank you very much.